The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton. Book Two. Chapter Nineteen. The day was fresh, with a lively spring breeze full of dust. All the old ladies in both families had got out their faded sables and yellowing ermines, and the smell of camphor from the front pews almost smothered the faint spring smell of the lilies banking the altar. Newland Archer, at the signal from the sexton, had come out of the vestry and placed himself with his best man on the chancel step of Grace Church. The signal meant that the brougham bearing the bride and her father was in sight, but there was sure to be a considerable interval of adjustment and consultation in the lobby, where the bridemaids were already hovering like a cluster of Easter blossoms. During this unavoidable lapse of time, the bridegroom, in proof of its eagerness, was expected to expose himself alone to the gaze of the assembled company, and Archer had gone through this formality as resignedly as through all the others which made of a nineteenth-century New York wedding a rite that seemed to belong to the dawn of history. Everything was equally easy, or equally painful, as one chose to put it, in the path he was committed to tread, and he had obeyed the flurried injunctions of his best man as piously as other bridegrooms had obeyed his own, in the days when he had guided them through the same labyrinth. So far he was reasonably sure of having fulfilled all his obligations. The bridesmaids ate bouquets of white lilac and lilies of the valley had been sent in due time, as well as the gold and sapphire sleeve links of the eight ushers and the best man's cat-eyes scarf-pen. Archer had sat up half the night trying to vary the wording of his thanks for the last batch of presents from men-friends and ex-lady loves. The fees for the bishop and the rector were safely in the pocket of his best man. His own luggage was already at Mrs. Manson Mingott's, where the wedding breakfast was to take place, and so were the travelling clothes into which he was to change, and a private compartment had been engaged in the train that was to carry the young couple to their unknown destination. Concealment of the spot in which the bridal night was to be spent being one of the most sacred taboos of the prehistoric ritual. "'Got the ring all right?' whispered young Vanderlyde in Newland, who was inexperienced in the duties of a best man, and awed by the weight of his responsibility. Newland made the gesture, which he had seen so many bridegrooms make. With his ungloved right hand, he felt into the pocket of his dark gray waistcoat, and assured himself that the little gold circlet, engraved inside, Newland to May, April, 1870, was in its place. Then, resuming his former attitude, his tall hat and pearl-gray gloves with black stitchings grasped in his left hand, he stood looking at the door of the church. Overhead, Handel's march swelled pompously through the imitation stone vaulting, carrying on its waves the faded drift of the many weddings at which, with cheerful indifference, he had stood on the same chantel step, watching other brides float up the nave toward other bridegrooms. How like a first night at the opera, he thought, recognizing all the same faces in the same boxes, no pews, and wondering if, when the last trump sounded, Mrs. Selfridge Mary would be there with the same towering ostrich feathers in her bonnet, and Mrs. Beaufort with the same diamond earrings and the same smile, and whether suitable proscenium seats were already prepared for them in another world. After that, there was still time to review, one by one, the familiar countenances in the first rows, the women's, sharp with curiosity and excitement, the men's, sulky with the obligation of having to put on their frock coats before luncheon, and fight for food at the wedding breakfast. Too bad the breakfast is at old Catherine's, the bridegroom could fancy Reggie Chivers saying, but I'm told that Lovell Mingott insisted on its being cooked by his own chef, so it ought to be good if one can only get at it and he could imagine Tillerton Jackson adding with authority, "'My dear fellow, haven't you heard? It's to be served at small tables in the new English fashion.'" Archer's eyes lingered a moment on the left-hand pew, where his mother, who had entered the church on Mr. Henry Vanderleiden's arm, sat weeping softly under her chantilly veil, her hands in her grandmother's ermine muff. "'Poor Janie,' he thought looking at his sister. Even by screwing her head around, she can only see the people in the few front pews, and they're mostly dowdy Newlands and Dagonettes. 
on the hither side of the white ribbon dividing off the seats reserved for the families he saw beaufort tall and red-faced scrutinizing the women with his arrogant stare beside him sat his wife all silvery chinchilla and violets and on the far side of the ribbon lawrence lefferts sleekly brushed head seemed to mount guard over the invisible deity of good farm who presided at the ceremony archer wondered how many flaws lefferts keen eye would discover in the ritual of his divinity then he suddenly recalled that he too had once thought such questions important the things that had filled his days seemed now like a nursery parody of life or like the wrangles of medieval schoolmen over metaphysical terms that nobody had ever understood a stormy discussion as to whether the wedding presents should be shown had darkened the last hours before the wedding and it seemed inconceivable to archer that grown-up people should work themselves into a state of agitation over such trifles and that the matter should have been decided in the negative by mrs welland saying with indignant tears i should as soon turn the reporters loose in my house yet there was a time when archer had had definitive and rather aggressive opinions on all such problems and when everything concerning the matters and customs of his little tribe had seemed to him fraught with world-wide significance and all the while i suppose he thought real people were living somewhere and real things happening to them here they come breathed the best man excitedly but the bridegroom knew better the cautious opening of the door of the church meant only that mr brown the livery stable-keeper gowned in black in his intermittent character of sexton was taking in a preliminary survey of the scene before marshalling his forces the door was softly shut again then after another interval it swung majestically open and a murmur ran through the church the family mrs welland came first on the arm of her eldest son her large pink face was appropriately solemn and her plum-coloured satin with pale blue side panels and blue ostrich plumes in a small satin bonnet met with general approval but before she had settled herself into a stately rustle in the pew opposite mrs archer the spectators were craning their necks to see who was coming after her wild rumours had been abroad the day before to the effect that mrs manson mingott in spite of her physical disabilities had resolved on being present at the ceremony and the idea was so much in keeping with her sporting character that bets ran high at the clubs as to her being able to walk up the nave and squeeze into a seat it was known that she had insisted on sending her own carpenter to look at the possibility of taking down the end panel of the front pew and to measure the space between the seat and the front but the result had been discouraging and for one anxious day her family had watched her dallying with the plan of being wheeled up the nave in her enormous bath chair and sitting enthroned in it at the foot of the chanchelle the idea of this monstrous exposure of her person was so painful to her relations that they could have covered with gold the ingenious person who suddenly discovered that the chair was too wide to pass between the iron uprights of the awning which extended from the church door to the curbstone the idea of doing away with the awning and revealing the bride to the mob of dressmakers and newspaper reporters who stood outside fighting to get near the joints of the canvas exceeded even old catherine's courage though for a moment she had weighed the possibility why they might take a photograph of my child and put it in the papers mrs welland exclaimed when her mother's last plan was hinted to her and from this unthinkable indecency the clan recoiled with a collective shudder the ancestress had had to give in but her concession was bought only by the promise that the wedding breakfast should take place under her roof though as the washington square connection said with the wellens house in easy reach it was hard to have to make a special price with brown to drive one to the other end of nowhere though all these transactions had been widely reported by the jacksons a sporting minority still clung to the belief that old catherine would appear in church and there was a distinct lowering of the temperature when she was found to have been replaced by her daughter-in-law mrs lovell mingott had a high colour and glassy stare induced in ladies of her age and habit by the effect of getting into a new dress but once the disappointment occasioned by her mother-in-law's non-appearance had subsided it was agreed that her black chantilly over lilac satin with a bonnet of parma violets formed the happiest contrast to mrs welland's blue and plum colour 
far distinct from the impression produced by the gaunt and menacing lady who followed on mr mingott's arm in a wild dishevelment of stripes and fringes and floating scarves and as this last apparition glided into view archer's heart contracted and stopped beating archer had taken it for granted that the marchioness manson was still in washington where she had gone some four weeks previous with her niece madame olenska it was generally understood that her abrupt departure was due to madame olenska's desire to remove her aunt from the baleful eloquence of dr agathon carver who had nearly succeeded in enlisting her as a recruit for the valley of love and in the circumstances no one had expected either of the ladies to return for the wedding for the moment archer stood with his eyes fixed on medora's fantastic figure straining to see who came behind her but the little procession was at an end for all the lesser members of the family had taken their seats and the eight tall ushers gathering themselves together like birds or insects preparing for some migratory maneuver were already slipping through the side doors into the lobby newland i say she's here the best man whispered archer roused himself with a start a long time had apparently passed since his heart had stopped beating for the white and rosy procession was in fact halfway up the nave the bishop the rector the two white-winged assistants were hovering about the flower-banked altar and the first chords of the spores symphony were strewing their flower-like notes before the bride archer opened his eyes but could they really have been shut as he imagined and felt his heart beginning to resume its usual task the music the scent of the lilacs on the altar the vision of the cloud of tulle and orange blossoms floated nearer and nearer the sight of mrs archer's face suddenly convulsed with happy sobs the low benedictory murmur of the rector's voice the ordered evolutions of the eight pink bridesmaids and the eight black ushers all these sights sounds and sensations so familiar in themselves so utterly strange and meaningless in his new relation to them were confusedly mingled in his brain my god he thought have i got the ring and once more he went through the bridegroom's convulsive gesture then in a moment may was beside him such radiance beaming from her that it sent a faint warmth through his numbness he straightened himself and smiled into her eyes dearly beloved we're gathered together here the rector began the ring was on her hand the bishop's benediction had been given the bridesmaids were apoise to resume their place in the procession and the organ was showing preliminary symptoms of breaking out into the mendelssohn march without which no newly wedded couple had ever emerged upon new york your arm i say give her your arm young newland nervously hissed and once more archer became aware of having been adrift far off in the unknown what was it that had sent him there he wondered perhaps the glimpse among the anonymous spectators in the transept of a dark coil of hair under the hat which a moment later revealed itself as belonging to an unknown lady with a long nose so laughably unlike the person whose image she had evoked that he asked himself if he were becoming subject to hallucinations now he and his wife were pacing down the nave carried forth on the light mendelssohn ripples the spring day beckoning to them through widely opening doors and mrs welland's chestnuts with big wide favors on their frontlets curvetting and showing off the front end of the canvas tunnel the footman who had a still bigger white favor on his lapel wrapped may's white cloak about her and archer jumped into the broom at her side she turned to him with a triumphant smile and their hands clasped under her veil darling archer said and suddenly the same black abyss yawned before him and he felt himself sinking into it deeper and deeper while his voice rambled on smoothly and cheerfully yes of course i thought i'd lost the ring no wedding would be complete if the poor devil of a bridegroom didn't go through that but you did keep me waiting you know i had time to think of every horror that might possibly happen she surprised him by turning in full fifth avenue and flinging her arms about his neck but none of her can happen now can it newland as long as we two are together every detail of the day had been so carefully thought out that the young couple after the wedding breakfast 
had ample time to put on their travelling clothes, descend the wide mingot stairs between laughing bridesmaids and weeping parents, and get into the broom under the traditional shower of rice and satin slippers. There was still half an hour left in which to drive to the station, buy the last weeklies at the bookstall with the air of seasoned travellers, and settled themselves in the reserved compartment in which May's maid had already placed her dove-coloured travelling cloak and glaringly new dressing-bag from London. The old Delac aunts at Rhinebeck had put their house at the disposal of the bridal couple, with a readiness inspired by the prospect of spending a week in New York with Mrs. Archer, and Archer, glad to escape the usual bridal suite in a Philadelphia or Baltimore hotel, had accepted, with equal alacrity. May was enchanted at the idea of going to the country and childishly amused at the vain efforts of eight bridesmaids to discover where their mysterious retreat was situated. It was thought very English to have a country house lent to one, and the fact gave a last touch of distinction to what was generally conceded to be the most brilliant wedding of the year. But where the house was no one was permitted to know, except the parents of the bride and groom, who, when taxed with the knowledge, pursed their lips and said mysteriously, ah they didn't, didn't tell us which was manifestly true since there was no need to once they were settled in their compartment and the train shaking off the endless wooden suburbs had pushed out into the pale landscape of spring talk became easier than archer had expected may was still in look and tone the simple girl of yesterday eager to compare notes with him as to the incidents of the wedding and discussing them as impartially as a bridesmaid, talking it over with an usher. At first Archer had fancied that this detachment was the disguise of an inward tremor, but her clear eyes revealed only the most tranquil unawareness. She was alone for the first time with her husband, but her husband was only the charming comrade of yesterday. There was no one whom she liked as much, no one whom she trusted as completely, and the culminating lark of the whole delightful adventure of engagement and marriage was to be off with him alone on a journey like a grown-up person like a married woman in fact it was wonderful that as he had learned in the mission garden of st augustine such depths of feeling could coexist with such absence of imagination but he remembered how even then she had surprised him by dropping back to inexpressive girlishness as soon as her conscience had been eased of its burden. And he saw that she would probably go through life, dealing to the best of her ability, with each experience as it came, but never anticipating any by so much as a stolen glance. Perhaps the faculty of unawareness was what gave her eyes their transparency, and her face the look of representing a type, rather than a person, as if she might have been chosen to pose for a civic virtue or a Greek goddess. The blood that ran so close to her fair skin might have been a preserving fluid rather than a ravaging element, yet her look of indestructible youthfulness made her seem neither hard nor dull, but only primitive and pure. In the thick of this meditation Archer suddenly felt himself looking at her with the startled gaze of a stranger, and plunged into a reminiscence of the wedding breakfast and Granny Mingott's immense and triumph pervasion of it may settled down to a frank enjoyment of the subject i was surprised though weren't you that aunt medora came after all ellen wrote that they were neither of them well enough to take the journey i do wish it had been she who had recovered did you see the exquisite old lace she sent me he had known that the moment must come sooner or later but he had somewhat imagined that by force of willing he might hold it at bay yes i no yes it was beautiful he said looking at her blindly and wondering if whenever he heard those two syllables all his carefully built-up world would tumble down around him like a house of cards aren't you tired it would be good to have some tea when we arrive i'm sure the ants have got everything beautifully ready he rattled on taking her hand in his and his mind rushed away instantly to the magnificent tea and coffee service of Baltimore silver which the Beauforts had sent, and which went so perfectly with Uncle Lobo Mingott's trays and side dishes. In the spring twilight the train stopped at Rhinebeck station, and they walked along the platform to the waiting carriage. Ah, oh, how awfully kind of the Vanderleidens! They've sent their man over from Scutercliff to meet us, Archer exclaimed, 
as a sedate person out of livery approached them and relieved the maids of her bags. I'm extremely sorry, sir, said this emissary, that a little accident has occurred at the Mr. Locke's, a leak in a water tank. It happened yesterday, and Mr. van der Luyden, who heard of it this morning, sent a housemaid up by the early train to get the patroon's house ready. It will be quite comfortable, I think you'll find, sir, and the Mr. Locke's have sent their cook over, so that it will be exactly the same as if you'd been at the Rhinebeck. Archer stared at the speaker so blankly that he repeated in still more apologetic accents. "'It'll be exactly the same, sir, I do assure you.' And May's eager voice broke out, covering the embarrassed silence. "'The same as Rhinebeck, the patroon's house. But it will be a hundred thousand times better, won't it, Newland? It's too dear and kind of Mr. van der Luyden to have thought of it.' And as they drove off with the maid beside the coachman— and their shining bridal bags on the seat beside them, she said excitedly, "'Only fancy I've never been inside it, have you? The van der Luydens show it to so few people. But they opened it for Ellen, it seems, and she told me what a darling place it was. She says it's the only house she's seen in America that she could imagine being perfectly happy in.' "'Well, that's what we're going to be, isn't it?' cried her husband gaily, and she answered with her boyish smile. End of Book Two, Chapter Nineteen of The Age of Innocence.